Welcome back to Love Letters and Mixtapes. I am so glad you're here. After you listen to this episode, please make sure to like, subscribe, rate it, and share. I see that so many of you are listening to the Daily Affirmations episodes, and I hope they continue to be tools that you can use for support, encouragement, and strengthening your daily meditation practice. If you enjoy this episode, please consider donating to support this podcast by clicking the link in my Instagram bio at Love Letters and Mixtapes. I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this podcast, Snake River Roasting Company is an organic coffee roaster located in the beautiful mountains of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Not only do they roast award-winning coffees, but their mission and commitment to supporting the rights of women farmers around the world are just incredible. I start every single morning with a cup of their Fire on the Mountain organic coffee blend. And if you're anything like me and you're particular about what you eat and drink and how it's sourced, Snake River Roasting Company has a free shipping code for you to give their delicious coffee a taste. Head to their website, snakeriverroastingco.com, and use the code COFFEELOVE at checkout for free shipping on all domestic coffee orders. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple gift cards to your friends and family this holiday season. This week, I wanted to speak with you about trauma. And whenever I sit down to write notes about these heavier topics that bring a lot of emotion to the surface for anyone who's listening or even for me who's writing and speaking about it, I really want to pause and just give a lot of thought to what I'm sharing here. And something that I want to say, and it's very important for anyone listening to keep in mind, is that there is not a single person on this planet who knows exactly what you have gone through, how it felt, how you perceived it, what it brought up for you, or how it exists in your life today. So when I talk about topics like trauma that people have very charged and negative connotations with, I don't do this so that you listen to this podcast episode and believe that every single thing I'm saying is perfect or right or the be-all end-all of this topic or even perfectly matches your experience. What I'm talking about today is the feelings associated with trauma, not the specifics or the facts of your personal experience. Because I don't know the specifics of your experience, I'm still sifting through the specifics of my own experiences, Um, and I don't need to know the details about your experience to talk about this topic, because when we're talking about trauma here, we're doing it to talk about connection and compassion. It's not a competition. And at most, this will be an episode that probably lasts like 45 minutes to an hour. It's not my PhD thesis or an article in a medical journal. I'm just sitting here talking about trauma with you because it's been so present in my life. And even if no one in your world is talking about it, or you don't feel as if you have the words yet to talk about your own experience or even the energy to sort through all of it, I'm here talking about it to let you know that even if it isn't today, there will be a day when you can talk about it and there will be people who can listen and understand. I read something the other day on social media that said, the people in your age group who did not experience life-altering trauma had an advantage over you. Your brain was focused on surviving while they were free to develop and grow. You might feel like you're behind, but it's because you were doing your very best to survive. And that really resonated with me because I've often shared that I believe trauma kind of traps us and keeps us at the age we experienced it. We struggle to mature emotionally beyond that moment. And it's really just something to think about as we talk about this. For most of my own life, I never felt as if I had anyone to talk about these experiences with. And that's not to point fingers. I just think we tend to look away from things that bring up feelings of shame or fear or remind us of our own vulnerabilities. When we talk about trauma, there's very much this idea that we're talking about some other person in some other town 
who had this terrible experience, but that it would never or could never actually touch us or anyone we know. I had a lot of well-meaning people in my own life who would look at me and say things like, what is wrong with you? And I actually heard that a lot for many years, and it always sounded a bit accusatory and aggressive, which was really hard to take, given what I knew about my own history. And when we're processing our own traumas and trying to exist in the world, we just have no tools to answer a question like that. And I don't even think it would be helpful, or should we have to answer a question like that? Because questions like that need a multiple choice answer, you know, something very clear cut, finite. There's no room for nuance. And if you've ever experienced trauma, you know that it is anything but finite and it's very blurry. It's dynamic and cunning in the most disruptive ways and at the most inconvenient times. And so people want to know what's wrong with us instead of asking the deeper question and preparing themselves to be in a place to actually receive our answers. Because the question that gets right to the point is not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you? And we do have to get really honest with ourselves when we inquire about someone else's experiences because our response can re-traumatize or compound the trauma someone else has experienced. And being honest with ourselves looks like asking, you know, do we have the mental capacity or the emotional intelligence to hear about someone else's traumatic experience? Do we have the hands to hold that pain and discomfort? Do we have the ability to not make it about us? So all that to say, as I'm sitting here in my house recording this episode with my neighbors arguing right outside my window, I am not doing this under the title of expert. I am having the same talk with you that I would have with anyone who came to me to discuss their trauma. Because all that is, really, is just two people sitting in the truth with some presence some moments of pause, and making room for some grace between all the exhales and inhales. And there's a quote that always resonated with me and reminded me of my own experience discussing traumatic events in my life. And it's always been a powerful reminder of how I can create and hold space for other people as they reveal things about themselves and their lives that you would never wish on an enemy. I am personally convinced that the basic search of every human being from the cradle to the grave is to find at least one other human being before whom he can stand completely naked, stripped of all pretense or defense, and trust that person not to hurt him because that other person has stripped himself naked too. And what on earth could possibly be better than that? To be seen, heard, known, understood, and accepted in our totality to trust and be trusted, to be fully present without our armor and defenses. And that's really important when we share our truth or our experience with trauma with other people, and maybe even more important when others share those things with us. So let's keep that in mind as both our foundation and our highest ideal to continually work toward as we move into this discussion of trauma. So what is trauma? And is trauma subjective and individually determined? Or is the criteria for trauma clear and narrow? Personally, I have not and do not feel comfortable determining what is traumatic to someone else. Because everyone experiences things differently. We all have different frames of reference, different thresholds, different perspectives, and coping methods. The American Psychological Association defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. The DSM-5 definition of trauma requires actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. And they say that stressful events not involving an immediate threat to life or physical injury, such as psychosocial stressors like divorce or job, they're not considered trauma in this definition. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a different definition. They say that individual trauma results from an event, 
series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And that's probably the definition that I most align with. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are, you know, pop psychologists and life coaches all over social media who firmly believe that everything all day long is trauma, that life is trauma, and no matter what you feel, it is traumatic. And how do we differentiate between a difficult life experience and trauma? For me, a very clear difference is that I don't have flashbacks, visceral physical reactions, or find myself perseverating on challenging life experiences. They may take a while to integrate, but they eventually weave into my life. I do find that I experience all of those things, the flashbacks, the visceral physical reactions, and the perseveration with past traumatic events where I feared for my own life and physical safety. And that sounds like a massive oversimplification, but it's a clear example that works for me. So you get to decide what works for you. And why is it important to talk about trauma? I'm sure that every single person in your life has a different perspective on this. Every single one of us has evolved in our thinking over time. Maybe what we thought about trauma when we were teenagers is drastically different than what we think of now. And some people will say, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't make excuses. That's my favorite one. Um, Stop crying and just get on with it. And not to dismiss anyone, but I don't have a single example in my 20 plus year career of that really working for anyone who is interested in a whole and present life. And it certainly wouldn't work for me. Trauma has a life of its own. And when it's not given space to heal, process, or transform, it begins to distort and show up in different areas of our lives. When I think about my own experience with trauma, I often wonder, can it be healed? Can I ever fully process it? Or is it something that becomes a part of me that I can alchemize and transform for the rest of my life? The most wounded and traumatized parts of me also just happen to show up as empathy, intuition, understanding, and compassion. Would I have had access to the depths of those emotions had I not experienced life-altering trauma? I actually don't know. I'll never know. That's not the life I was given. We can't live in the what-ifs or the what-could-have-been. All we have is to live and work with what we've got. There are four fairly common categories of trauma responses. Those are flight, fight, freeze, and fawn. In flight, we might be workaholics, maybe overthinkers. We experience intense anxiety, panic, and obsessive thoughts. We might be perfectionists and have difficulty standing still or sitting with our thoughts and feelings. When we are in fight, we may experience explosive outbursts of anger, be very controlling of other people. Maybe we're seen as a bully, maybe even a narcissist. When we're in freeze, we find ourselves getting stuck. We actually experience difficulty in making decisions from big ones to small ones. We have a habit of dissociating, isolating, and numbing ourselves. And I think fawning is the one that's actually least talked about, so I'm glad I'm mentioning it. Um, When we fawn, we become people pleasers with little to no boundaries. We lose our identities. We become easily overwhelmed and maybe even codependent. You may have heard the term trauma-informed when it comes to offerings from yoga to therapy to medical offices. And trauma-informed care is defined as practices that promote a culture of safety, empowerment, and healing, which I think that we all kind of assume is a given, 
especially in those environments. But as we explore this topic further, we realize it really isn't and that we can all make adjustments to how we approach things or structure our offerings or relationships or conversations to align with a trauma-informed framework. A trauma-informed approach to care acknowledges that healthcare organizations and care teams need to have a complete picture of a patient's life situation, the past and the present, in order to provide effective healthcare services with a healing orientation. And there are six key principles of a trauma-informed approach. Safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historical, and gender issues. There's also three E's to pay attention to when talking about trauma, and those are the events, the experiences, and the effects. Because it's not just about what happens to us when we're talking about trauma. It's how we experience it and how it has a ripple effect in our life outside of the traumatic event. So you can have a traumatic event 20 years ago that continues to show up in your personal relationships or in your workplace or in your family. It doesn't end when the actual trauma ends. There's also four R's that we use in trauma-informed care. Realization about the trauma and how it can affect people and groups. Recognizing the signs of trauma having a system in place which can respond to trauma, and resisting re-traumatization. Childhood trauma is something I spoke about pretty extensively in a previous episode, and I believe it was episode 13, Adult Children of Alcoholics Part 1. And in that episode, I mentioned something called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Quiz, which was part of a study to categorize adverse childhood experiences or potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood from birth to 17 years of age. And they used the results of this study and quiz to unearth a surprising link between childhood trauma and the chronic diseases that people develop as adults, as well as social and emotional problems. And this includes heart disease, lung cancer, diabetes, as well as depression, violence, and suicide. And the life expectancy of people with six or more ACEs is 10 to 20 years shorter than those without any ACEs. So this is a pretty important study, and it's really letting people know that trauma is something that impacts us. It's not, oh, we can just muscle through it. You can just get over it because it's affecting our our physicality. It's affecting our health, and it doesn't end, like I said, when the experience ends. And if you're interested in learning more about the Adverse Childhood Experience quiz and study, I suggest you dive into some research. There's also a fantastic TED Talk that explores this study and the outcomes. And when I think about childhood trauma, I think about the ways in which children express themselves and exert control when they're experiencing out-of-control situations. And disclaimer, this is not a clinical summary. This is simply my observation, having worked with children on and off for almost 20 years. And when children feel a need to exert control over a situation, they begin to control the only things they can. They don't have a lot of agency, but they have some. And this includes when and how they go to sleep, what they do or do not eat, how loud they get or when they talk, including selective mutism, and when they go to the bathroom. They will communicate with their behavior all the things that they don't have the language for, all of the things they can't express verbally, all the things they're scared to say. And I'm sure some child psychologists out there could disagree with me, but this is just my observation of having worked very closely with children because it's those inconvenient behaviors that are their ways of communicating something. So it's not about children expanding their vocabulary. It's about the adults around them being better observers and listeners and intervening with support and care during those critical moments. I want to take a moment and talk about men who experience trauma because as little room as I feel that there is for women to express and process their trauma, 
It almost feels as if we never allow men to do this. And you know, we say we want them to, we want them to be open and vulnerable and sensitive. But when they actually do, and it turns out that it's messy and scary and challenges how we perceive them, we as a society kind of recoil a bit. And I, for one, do not want to do that. And the first step in not doing something is being aware of when and how we do it, and then admitting to ourselves that we have to deconstruct our own programming. And when I brought up the topic of trauma with some of the men in my life, they all shared pretty much the same things. And they said that they were always told and raised to believe that trauma was something that happened far from home and to other people and that they could never be traumatized because they weren't dead. Like in order to be traumatized, you had to be killed. And trauma was always referenced in ways that were very grandiose and full of physical violence, specifically not sexual violence or emotional violence. And it only happened to people who had basically survived a war. Now, maybe the men in your life have had different experiences, but that is what was shared with me. For them, there was just a very narrow definition of what trauma could be and how it could affect them and how they could express it and how long it could have an impact on them. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, whenever I've been asked to be a speaker at a 12-step meeting, you usually talk for about an hour on what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now in whatever program you're in recovery in. But in that journey, you're also sharing things that have happened to you and how integrating the 12 steps has helped you in recovery and emotional sobriety. And I'm pretty straightforward when I share my own story because I'm not ashamed of it. I'm very grounded in my truth, and I know that it's powerful medicine for someone to hear me talk about the things that I've lived through and to do so with ease, calm, and perspective. We need to witness others escape fight or flight mode to know that it's possible for us as well. And I wish I had seen that myself 20 years ago because it really would have helped. So anytime that I've led a meeting and I stayed to talk with people afterwards, it's always the men who have violent pasts and traumatic histories that would always come up to me and say, thank you for talking about that. I don't think I will ever be able to talk about what happened to me, but it helped to hear you talk about it. And these are the men who have usually been in and out of prison for a long time for violent and extreme behavior. And I am in no way dismissing that or what these men have done but I'm inviting us to see a correlation between it. We can't change what has happened to other people, but we can change how we respond in moments when someone comes to us with their trauma or when we think that something has happened to someone. I'm a big fan of the moth, and I've definitely spoke about it on this podcast before. The moth is a nonprofit dedicated to the art of storytelling and the connections that can be made through shared experiences and how transformative they are. And one of the most powerful moth episodes I think I've ever listened to is the one by a man named Ed Gavigan. And the title is, Whatever Doesn't Kill Me. And you can find it on YouTube pretty easily, or you can just DM me and I'll send you the link. But in 15 minutes, he breaks down his experience with life-altering trauma and how difficult it was to process his own experience and just live his life afterwards. So often, under the guise of being supportive or positive, the world can dismiss our traumatic experiences and how much energy it takes for us to heal and recalibrate afterwards. Like, what it takes to just get up and go to work, to wash the dishes, to take a shower. I don't think people realize that you can't just be overwhelmed with the gratitude of surviving something that this exists in your body, and it's very hard to shake. And that's really what his talk focused on and how that impacted him as a man. It was just wonderful, and I highly recommend you listen to it if you have a chance. And every time I listen to it, it makes me think of my own experience working with patients at the Cancer Support Center. I facilitated several support groups, but the ones that were most challenging, shockingly enough, were the post-treatment groups. And these were the groups dedicated to people who were in the post-treatment phase of their experience with cancer. 
So generally, immediately following their last medical intervention, up to two to three years post-treatment. And it was the group that everyone said they didn't need because the world told them they didn't need it. These patients would hear things like, you are cancer-free. You should just be happy. Just pick up where you left off and go right back to your life. Pretend like it never happened. And I understand that saying something like that is fear. It's, it's fear driving those statements. And I totally get that. We're afraid that this thing happened to someone and we want to push away the part of us that is scared of it. You know, we want to push away the vulnerability and shut down any opportunity for someone to express how they're feeling because we're so scared that it could happen to us. Cancer is traumatizing. It is traumatizing to have surgery and permanently change your body and have that permanently change your life. And more than that, Trauma compounds within us. So when we experience a trauma, even if it has nothing to do with our past traumas, it brings everything to the surface because it's not about the facts. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, it's about the feelings. So if I feel as if my life is being threatened or my very livelihood or just anything, it's going to bring up any past moment where I also felt like that. Another group I created when I worked there was the Breast Cancer Support Group, and I created it because we had such an overwhelming number of people coming to us diagnosed with breast cancer and not enough specialized resources for them. And I remember explaining to colleagues that the purpose of the group was not just to focus on cancer or cancer treatments. It was a safe space for group members to explore previous traumas that their current experience was bringing to the surface. And what that meant was that we talked about everything from childhood sexual trauma to rape, to abortion, miscarriages, sexual harassment, addiction, sobriety, and even grief. And in doing that, we created a space to also process the experience that the group members were going through with regard to the cancer diagnosis and their treatment. But if we didn't make a space for all of it, I'm not sure that the group would have been as helpful, safe, or effective. An important question that I continue to ask myself about trauma is what situations, dynamics, and relationships force me to confront or tell the truth about my trauma? And I know that the word triggers is often really overused, so I'm going to just step away from that. I mean, I could probably do a whole episode just on trauma triggers, but maybe just step back and pause and think, like, what brings my trauma to the surface? Is it feelings of safety? Like when someone actually creates a space for me to feel safe and relax and when I feel seen and heard? Or is it in moments when I feel threatened. And I bring that up not because just the awareness of it fixes everything, but it is a step. And I am a big advocate of having a wraparound approach to all things. I think that it can be really hard for some of us. We get very rigid and we think, well, I can only do one thing. You know, I can go to therapy, but that's it. I can't go to therapy in a support group. I can't go to therapy in a 12-step group. I can't go to a 12-step group and volunteer outside the 12-step group. And I think I'm just inviting you to take a step back and say, you have all of these things available to you. And I understand that therapy is sometimes impacted by our finances, but there are a lot of free services out there. And taking advantage of them doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean that someone else could be doing it better with just one of them. It's just that these things are there and why not take advantage of them? You have nothing to lose by learning more about yourself and other human beings. And I always encourage anyone, I mean, every single human being, but if you're also trying to work through some of your traumatic experiences, to participate in activities that soothe and strengthen your nervous system. Because our nervous system regularly crashes when we're dealing with PTSD and trauma. And anything we can do to support that part of us just can help us in every other situation of our lives. Um, 
you know, I wanted to share a personal experience and I think I'm just going to do it. And (laughs) as I always say, I can always edit it out later if I feel like it. But um, in a previous episode, I mentioned that I had a very traumatic and life-altering experience when I was 23 years old. And as I think about that experience, I think about how it happened on a Friday night and I was back to work on Monday and no one knew what happened to me because I was just in survival mode and I didn't know any other way to be. And I didn't feel that there was space for me to have had this thing happen to me. And I just didn't have the words for it. And I had so much to do after this incident happened because it happened in my home. And I simply couldn't live there anymore. My nervous system, just the idea of, you know, parking and walking into my house just almost destroyed me. And I didn't feel safe there any longer. And so within two weeks, I ended up moving to my apartment in New York City. And within a few weeks of that, I signed up to be a volunteer with the Mount Sinai Savvy Program. And you know, 99.99% of New Yorkers have never heard of this program. Um, it moves very underground. And it is a program where they offer sexual assault and violence intervention support in emergency rooms for people who are brought in who have experienced those things. The Savvy Program trains and offers transportation and guidance and follow-up work and support to the volunteers who do this. And I know it can sound a little extreme that I would throw myself into that, but I needed to have some kind of understanding of what had gone on in my own life. And that was the first thing I reached for. And yes, I was going to therapy. (laughs) Um, I terrified my therapist at the time with the story I had to tell her. And I just knew that I needed a little bit more and that by being of service, I could process my own experience, but also show up in kindness and compassion for someone else who might be experiencing the same thing that I went through. Um, It goes back to something that they say a lot in 12-step meetings, and that is keep what you have by giving it away. And you have to give it away to even get it in the first place. And although I was not really in the programs at that time, I just feel that that was a lesson and something I'd known in my core that I had to do. And that I had survived something that I did not think I was going to survive. And I couldn't feel gratitude. I had a very hard time touching that emotion. But I knew that I was grateful that I was still here and that I wanted to be there for someone who maybe had survived something that I had survived and just didn't have anyone because I didn't have anyone. So this Mount Sinai program, um, when I when I joined, um, offered, like I said, extensive training. Um, it was like every weekend for months and months and months. Um, and they had a network of nine New York City emergency rooms. And they created a schedule for all the volunteers. And so all of these emergency rooms had my phone number. And if someone was brought in who had experienced a trauma that fit into these categories, they would call me. I would call a car service. The car service would pick me up and drop me off at the hospital. And I would immediately be brought to that person's bed. And I would stay with them from that moment until the moment that they walked out of the hospital. That means I was there for any interaction with police officers. I was there during the rape kits. I was there when they had to tell their families or their partner what had just happened to them. And it was overwhelming, but at the same time, profoundly healing. Because I had this story in my head that I was all alone when this thing happened to me. And I just didn't feel like I could tell anyone or talk with anyone about it. Just no one would understand. And I didn't want to get stuck in that story. And so that was my version of not being stuck in my own story was to not recreate that for someone else. 
It was to say, I am available to show up and have this energy and wisdom and dedication move through me to be a volunteer in this way. Um, I just want to share that because I'm sure that there's something accessible to you that you can do if this is something you're passionate about or you want to work on this part of yourself or you want to give back. There are programs out there. You just have to look for them. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. So let's talk about boundaries when we're talking about trauma, because trauma destroys our boundaries. Something is happening to us and affecting us in a way that we would never personally allow. And whenever I talk about boundaries, I think about this great quote by a woman named Victoria Erickson, and she said, boundaries are not walls. They're your beaches that others can bask on. Not everyone should swim in your oceans. And I love that quote. It totally speaks to how I feel about boundaries and how helpful boundaries have been in processing trauma because I personally don't feel that I owe anyone my story. I don't owe anyone that access and I get to decide who I feel safe with, who I feel comfortable with, who I can trust with the facts about something that happened to me. And it's really important as we are healing or processing through our traumatic experience to begin identifying and building healthy boundaries that work for us. And that might look a lot different than it did prior to our traumatic experience. Do I have to spend the rest of my life completely guarded and shut down and never let anyone in? No. Do I have to share the most private and intimate details of one of the most difficult experiences of my entire life with every single person I come across? Probably not. But when we're talking about boundaries, we're talking about finding a middle way, finding a way that feels safe for us and allowing that to fluctuate with our comfort level and our inner strength and our inner peace. And I want to do a whole episode on post-traumatic stress disorder and how we can care for ourselves and others, but I do believe that that deserves its own episode. So I would say look for that in the coming weeks. But right now, let's focus on how can we support someone who has experienced trauma and comes to us to either process it or talk about it. And I feel as if this is something that never gets spoken about and tools that we never are asked to learn how to develop because there's some kind of an assumption that we are all naturally good at that. And I don't know why we would <laughs> because really uncomfortable situations that bring up big feelings for us is not usually when we shine. It's usually what brings up all of our discomfort and all of our insecurities and vulnerabilities. So I'm just saying as a trauma survivor and as someone who's worked with trauma survivors, here are some things that you can do to support others. Number one, don't push for details. You don't have to play detective or search for inconsistencies in someone's story you don't have to do that. And then when they call you out on it, say, that's not what I'm doing. I just want the facts. Like, you don't have to do any of that. You can just receive their information and trust that when someone has been traumatized, sometimes they're not communicating or expressing their information in the most perfect way possible. And it's not up to you to clean it up. It's just up to you to receive and let all of that information land wherever it does. Another thing is don't allow your feelings to overtake theirs. You know, it can be really challenging when you talk about physical assault or sexual assault and immediately someone goes into a rage because they want to kill the person who did that. And that's them feeling very loyal to you and very caretaking and very concerned for you. But what you don't realize in that moment is that you're just bringing up more violence and fear to a person who has just experienced intense violence and fear. 
And that's what, not what they need in the moment. So to not have your feelings take up the entire room and to make space for their feelings to kind of fluctuate as they share this information. And in alignment with that, don't force them to take care of you. Because sometimes we do that. Let's be honest. Sometimes someone's having a really upsetting experience, but then our feelings take over. And then the person who's having the upsetting experience has to calm us down and take care of us. So let's not put anyone in that position. And I think the last thing I would say is that always remember that the first time you are hearing about something may not be the first time that they are talking about it or processing it. And I know that that has happened in my own life where I have friends who knew me when I was 23 and they spent time with me. They were in my apartment. They we did things together. And, the, you know, they'll tell me now that we're in our 40s. You never told me that that's what happened to you. But I processed it with other people because that's what I needed at the time. Maybe I just needed you to be a friend at the time. And maybe I didn't want to permanently alter our relationship and catapult you into feeling like you had to take care of me in a moment when I was stressed enough. So just some things to remember. Now, this part of the episode might be a little bit controversial, but I'm always going to err on the side of humanity on this podcast, which is pretty inclusive. And there's a great deal of black and white thinking in online pop psychology media and even in healing communities surrounding who deserves healing. There's this very pronounced concept of good versus evil. Well, I'm here to say that I've listened to enough fifth steps in my life and in my own recovery programs, and I've conducted enough one-on-one sessions to know that the lines are very blurred. It's quite rare that someone is 100% evil. A lot of harm has been caused by people who are just like us, humans who make horrific human mistakes and terrible human choices and cause life-altering harm and trauma to other humans. And it's hard for me to accept that as someone who survived a severe physical trauma. I struggle with that. I don't want to see the person who harmed me as human as having had a wide range of emotions or experiences or having been vulnerable or been traumatized themselves. Part of me wants to say it's not my job. It almost feels easier for me to process my own experience if I can look at this other person as a monster. And I say almost because the truth is that it doesn't help me personally heal. And my journey does not have to be your journey. When I share that, I'm just sitting in the truth of what works for me, and I'm not forcing that on you. It helped me greatly when I did not look at this person as an other, and I have no idea why. But when I saw the entire experience, I was just able to process it better. You know, I always hear gems of wisdom in 12-step meetings, and I'm not even talking about the slogans like, one day at a time, or keep coming back, or... (laughs) all the corny things that people say and some people hate and some people love. I'm talking about how people share their hearts and their journeys of transformation. And there are three things that come to mind when we're talking about being a transgressor and facing the fact that we have harmed others. The first is you will either be the cause or the casualty of someone else's pain. The second, God is always in the room. And the third, I am less than the actions I take. And what that means to me today as I'm talking about trauma is that we are a mixed bag of positive and negative qualities, of care and of harm. And that when I can take a look at my own life with rigorous honesty, apologize, and make sincere amends, then I can see how easy it was for me at certain times to cross lines that I said I would never cross or do things I swore I would never do, or behave in ways that are in complete contradiction to my character or how I was raised. And that's not an excuse for harm or abuse or inflicting trauma on others in any way. But the closer that I am in sitting with the truth of the entirety of who I am, the good and the bad, the better understanding I will have of other people and how I am responsible to myself and to them to repair the harm that I have caused. 
When I hear God is always in the room, it's a reminder to me that I am not forsaken or forgotten. My God, my higher power, the universe, whatever words you want to use, that being doesn't drop me when I am failing as a human. God does not abandon me when I am in rooms that I have no business being in or doing things I have no business doing. God is with me in my worst moments, and God is there to guide me back when I want to run and hide or just abandon myself. I hear a lot of people in 12-step meetings talk about narrowly escaping death or harm or even legal repercussions, and they say things like, God was looking out for me. And I challenge that a bit. God or a spirit of a loving universe or the energetic embodiment of the love and connection between all of us is always with us, even when we refuse to see it. We don't only have access to God or spirituality when we are good. I have to imagine that in our worst moments, in moments of causing harm, that God is filling the room with grace that we could access if we only turn toward it. It's an invitation to change how we perceive ourselves in the grand scheme of things. It's an invitation to humility, and humility changes how we perceive ourselves and others. And the final saying, I am less than the actions I take, has always resonated with me because we all get trapped in our heads, replaying scenarios over and over again, picturing this ideal self we would be if only. Picturing how we would masterfully handle situations or impress people or show kindness under duress. But what about our actions in our daily lives? Because it's all well and good to imagine the person we want to be seen as, but how are we showing up in the world? What actions are we taking every single day? What actions are we taking in the difficult moments? And how different would our self-perception be if it could only be measured by our actions? So what if I am the one who has inflicted trauma on someone else? What do I do? I am not here to absolve anyone of harm or coerce anyone into premature or unwarranted forgiveness. Everyone is on their own path, and I would raise an eyebrow to anyone who forces their method of processing trauma on you. But I am here to say that trauma is also traumatizing to the person who causes harm. And I know that because I've worked with many people who have harmed others. And if you are listening to me talk about trauma today and you're having flashbacks of things you've done to harm other people, to alter the course of someone else's life, to rob them of safety, there is work to be done on yourself and there's no better time to start than right now. I'm not here to dispense forgiveness or sweep it under the rug. I'm saying you could begin the journey of repair, of amends, and of healing today by taking an honest action of accountability. And whatever that looks like for you, that could be walking into a 12-step meeting to learn about how sober people are living and what they're doing, even though you think it's stupid. It could be going to therapy and not stopping when it gets difficult. It could be taking an anger management class. There's always something that we can do, some action step that can lead us back into right relationship with ourselves and others. And I am in no way recommending or advocating dialing the phone of the person you harmed and pouring out your heart. I'm talking about doing the internal work to create a strong foundation of acceptance and acknowledgement before making any external repair. Because maybe we have no idea about the harm we've actually done. Maybe our perception was distorted. Trauma is such a big subject, and I am sure that I have barely scratched the surface. I was so self-conscious when I started writing the notes to this episode because I just understood how important it is to talk about this, and I didn't want to mess it up, which sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> My inner critic is so loud, and I have no idea why I can get up on stage in front of a thousand people and talk about the worst things that have ever happened to me, my own trauma. And I don't know, I feel totally fine doing it, but recording this podcast was pretty hard. And I can definitely see myself doing a part two and three on this topic because there's so much more to say. When I was writing notes for this episode, I was looking through things that kind of inspire me and I came across an older sermon by Nadia Bolz-Weber when she was the pastor of House for All Sinners and Saints. 
And she was talking about the story of the woman at the well. And she said, I have been thinking about the hidden things in me, the stuff where I'd rather die than have it come to light, the damage and sin and shame that I can't admit to, and how that stuff is such a powerful force in my life that it's like a propeller. I mean, the wounded parts of me are what keep me in motion because I have to try and make up for them or try and convince myself and everyone else that they aren't there or I have to try and get them healed by the love and attention of other people, even though none of that ever works. But wow, it sure does keep me in motion. It's weird how many novels we can read and films we can watch where a character's behavior is finally explained by some damage from their past that they're trying to make up for. And yet it is so hard to admit this in ourselves. The name of this podcast is Love Letters and Mixtapes. And the inspiration for that was a desire to write, share, and talk about things that our younger selves needed to hear, whether that was 30 years ago, three years ago, or yesterday. And if I was going to write a love letter to my younger self about trauma, it would probably go something like this. I had all of these wonderful things that I wanted to say in this love letter. I actually laid awake in bed a few nights this week thinking about this part right here. And now as I'm recording, All I can think to say is, we all have that one secret we carry, that memory that plays on the screen inside our minds, the thing that can bring us to our knees, those certain wounds that never seem to heal. And it feels as if these things are a barrier, a cage that can prevent us from reaching or connecting with other people. It can feel as if we're a thousand miles away from who we used to be or who we could be with no way back. Those feelings are big and loud and I'm not here to argue with them. I just want you to remember that there are people and places in this world that can meet you where you are, that can walk with you into some of your darkest experiences and hold you for all that you are right now, today. Even if you don't like or love yourself or feel safe within yourself, you are not forsaken, you are not forgotten, and you are not too far gone. You are loved. And until next week, make sure to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast listening platform. Check out this week's playlist on my personal Spotify account. And join me on Instagram at Love Letters and Mixtapes. If you enjoyed this episode, consider donating to support this podcast by clicking the link in my Instagram bio.